Hey there guys, good morning. So today is just chilled Sunday energy and we're gonna talk about diversity. I really hope you can leave this video realizing how powerful diverse teams are and really look to not only build diversity but inclusivity in your organizations. This is such a good book. Good morning and welcome back to Unjaded Jade. So today is Sunday and I have had a blissfully lazy morning. I sat in bed, I read this incredible book. The weather today actually looks decent. We've got a blue sky, like it's a little bit windy, but we'll take it. And I've really been protecting my weekend. Like I try and work quite consistently in the week and on the weekend I'm like, this is your time to relax. But today, um, I want you guys to get ready with me because I never do these kind of videos and it is an excuse for me to talk about this incredible book that I have just read. I started it last night, I just finished it this morning and I can't wait to talk to you guys more about the power of diversity in organizations, in teams, in institutions and whenever you're trying to solve some kind of complex problem, diversity wins. Diversity always wins. Okay, so today we are going for a cute family walk. Not gonna lie, that doesn't happen often because our family hates walking and hiking. I really like it, but my family, mm -mm. So I'm gonna make an effort. I'm actually gonna put some light makeup on. I'm gonna choose like a decent outfit and you can come along and we can chat about Rebel Ideas by Matthew Said. Say, say. I'm gonna look up how to say that. Matthew Syed. Syed. Come along to the wardrobe. My, oh my god, I just tripped. <laughs> oh. So I'm still clumsy, surprise. Um, come along to the wardrobe. Okay, I'm really excited as well because I try not to play too much into fast fashion and most of my items I either thrift or buy second hand or um, in this case today. So I have not bought a new top like from like an online store or something like that in years but i treated myself i did some research and i found this really cool ethical brand that like recycles materials to make new clothes i'm not gonna lie it was kind of expensive but i'm like oh I invest in long-term pieces i'm gonna wear it today it's the coolest top it makes me feel like a freaking lavender princess let me show you how cool this top is if you know me well i am a sucker for off the shoulder tops fancy sleeve tops and fancy like wide leg or flared trousers. I just love a bit of, a bit of something like weird and different. And this top is gorgeous. And it's also reversible so you can make it white. The shop is called 07 Days. As I said, it's kind of expensive, but I kind of just love it. Okay, time to get ready. I'm gonna take you through my very limited skincare routine and put some makeup on. To do this, I'm going to put this on. I'm gonna be one of these trendy girls with the headbands. Ooh, trendy. This top is just princess energy. Okay, I have just cleansed my face and I'm just gonna use some toner. This one is vegan cruelty free, we love. Okay, but let's talk about this book. Also, I don't know if you're meant to put this on with your hand. I don't think you are. I think you're meant to use like cotton buds or like a reusable pad, but surprise, I don't do that. Okay, so in this book, Saeed, he challenges the notion that more diversity compromises excellence, which is something that a lot of companies actually think. A lot of companies treat diversity measures as a tick box exercise instead of as something that will enhance the organization. So yeah, he challenges this notion by exploring many different teams of homogenous people and diverse teams. And he shows how there are a lot of flaws in homogenous thinking. Okay, quick interlude. I am going to now use my hyaluronic acid concentrate, which apparently is, is good for your skin. Apparently it's like locks in moisture. I don't use it every day, but today I'm, why not? Okay, so I'm going to explore two main takeaways today that I had from this book. The first main takeaway, the most important takeaway from the book is how incredibly important diversity is. And I'm gonna go ahead and define diversity a bit later, but wow, like, as an individual, individuals are powerful, you know? You, you get some really clever people, got loads of great education, they've done really well in life. But you see, teams are not about individual brilliance. The magic of a team comes from combining so many individual people that create something that's bigger than just the sum of all of them individually. So for example, if each person on their own had five ideas and you put 10 people together, 
You don't just have 50 ideas, you don't just add it up. The power of a team is that it creates something exponentially bigger, it multiplies the genius and the ideas. But here's the thing, here's the, here's the interesting little caveat. Carve caveat? How do I say that word? I don't know. Some, sometimes I just really don't like my accent. I just feel like it's overly like posh and annoying. I don't know. Real talk. <laughs> uh, what am I using now, Jay? Uh, I'm now going to use the Beauty Kitchen Effective Natural Sustainable Hydra Boost Day Cream. Don't ask me if this is really good. I just use it. I use this in the day and then at night I use uh, more of a gel lotion because my skin can get quite oily and then I get spots. Um, we don't like spots, so. No, and this one has vitamin C, which is meant to be good if you combine it with SPF, so then your skin is protected from the sun. <laughs> Me trying to become a skincare guru in quarantine. We'll see. Okay, yes, yeah, so here's the thing. You have an intelligent individual, but if you take 10 intelligent people who have all been taught by the same people, they've all gone to Harvard or Oxford, and they've been taught by the same professors in the same line of thinking. They have a very similar demographic background. Individually, these people, they are all brilliant. The team is still gonna be brilliant, but those 10 Davids who are white, cis, straight men aren't really gonna add that much to each other's perspectives. Sure, they're gonna have a great time. They're gonna be very comfortable together. They're probably gonna share a lot of opinions, which can be useful for speed in a team, but this is known as knowledge clustering, where no one's perspectives are really challenged, and it's kind of like confirmation bias, because people are so comforted by everyone agreeing with their ideas that they think the ideas are better than they might be. Now instead, place one of these individually talented Davids in a team with I don't know, a, a black trans woman, an artsy creative man from China, a, I don't know, a top mathematician from India, a, an, a shy girl from, I don't know, Sussex, an outspoken white queer man. You know what I mean? If you just throw in all these other diverse perspectives, like, oh, someone who studies English, someone who studies art, someone who studies maths, and put them on the same complex problem, can you just imagine how interesting that conversation would be. Like they all have to tackle the same thing, but they're bringing in these new lenses. Suddenly, you've got a lot of new perspectives on an old problem. Okay, I am now going to use some high definition facial oil because why not? This is gonna be a long video, so let's go all out with the, with the skincare. Again, I don't know if this is the way you do it. I think I saw a TikTok where they did this interesting <laughs> face massage technique where they just basically go, you ready? Up, up, don't pull the skin, just rub it in. Oh, oh. My memory card has run out of storage, so I just ran and grabbed another one, so we're back. Now, because I'm just gonna be even more extra today, I do this like a few days a week. A cheap jade roller. I don't actually think it is jade, but that's fine because we've got a real jade. <laughs> Coming back to this topic, there's a really great quote from William B. Yeats, who's a great poet. He said, it is not about seeing something new. It is about seeing something familiar from a new perspective. And that is what diversity is. It is taking the same organization, the same problem, and applying these new lenses to it. I'm sure these, these lenses might disagree, but through having discussion about it, you will collectively arrive at a much better position or final idea than if you would just stick with your one opinion. Okay, so. What is diversity? So, this book details two types of diversity. You have cognitive diversity and demographic diversity. Cognitive diversity is the way you think, and this is influenced by your teachers, the information you consume, the frames of thinking you have learnt. And now this is interesting because you can have two people who look diverse. For example, you have a white boy and a black girl and they have gone through the same education system, the same school. They've both gone to Oxford and they've both studied under the same professor and the same subject. Now on the surface, they look diverse by the standards that we know, but cognitively they're not that diverse because they've consumed the same theories, ideologies, ways of thinking. Equally, you can have two white boys who look very similar. They both study the same subject, 
but if they've been exposed to very different teachers, very different materials about the same topic, then they can be cognitively very diverse. For example, two different frames of thinking about the same economic model. And then we have demographic diversity, which is the one that most people think of when they think of diversity. This is where you can have similar educational experience, but you have a different religion, a different race, a different upbringing. You're a different age, you're a different sexuality, many different things. And obviously these things do change the subconscious lens that you see the world and you see problems through. And both cognitive and demographic diversity are keys to success. So that was my first takeaway from the book. Diversity, freaking important. The second takeaway, however, and I think this is lost on so many people and so many organizations, you cannot just have diversity. You have to actively create systems that allow the expression of diverse perspectives and opinions. I'm just putting on some SPF back to 50. But yes, to illustrate this, I want you to imagine an organization, right, where on the surface, it looks kind of diverse. At the bottom, you have got a range of races, ethnicities, ages, sexual orientations, blah, blah, blah. But as you go up the hierarchy, the top of the hierarchy is still run by a very specific demographic. And in this organization, if it is a strict hierarchy, it is highly unlikely that these people at the bottom are gonna feel psychologically safe to be able to express their diverse opinions. And the diverse opinions are so important, that's what, that's what makes diversity. It's not just what you see on the surface. So the question becomes, how is it that you can set up frameworks in organizations that allow people to just share openly their perspectives? Beautiful. I'm really just going overboard today. I'm kind of here for it. Oh, I should use primer, shouldn't I? I have this primer that I think I've had since I was like 12 and I don't know if it's good. I know you're not meant to use makeup for that long, but here we are. Half my makeup I got before I cared about veganism or cruelty free or any of that. So half of it is just like, don't recommend. <laughs> okay, so one of my favorite systems that was introduced in this book, making people safe to share their opinions, is um, something used by Amazon, actually. It was used a lot in the early days and it is called the golden silence. <laughs> so this golden silence is that when they have a board meeting, normally you would have someone propose an idea and then everyone discusses they share their opinions, probably influenced by other people, and then they come to a decision. Amazon changed this. Instead, the person proposing the new idea has to write a six page memo, which is very useful because it forces you to be succinct and have clarity in your ideas. Instead of rambling, you've got to put it in this memo. And here's the interesting bit. So for the first 30 minutes of this board meeting, no one talks. Every person must sit and read this memo in silence. They can take notes, they can establish their perspective on whatever's been proposed. And the magic is that they don't know what anyone else is thinking. They haven't heard the senior executive's opinion, you know? They get to reflect on how they feel about it so that by the time the 30 minutes is up, they are encouraged to share their true diverse opinion. And what's also really special about this is that the senior executive talks last. So you don't know what your boss thinks. It doesn't matter what they think, it's what you think. Can you just imagine the power if everyone in the room was open to someone at the low end of the organization being like, this is very racist, this is very homophobic. Just creating that space where it's not gonna influence their job security, their social standing, like it's just, we want your honest opinion. Yeah, so honestly, I think this is the place that many businesses are at right now. I don't think it's a question of diversity. I think it's a question of inclusion. How is it you can support your employees or your students at university to feel like they can just be honest about issues in an organization. Like how can you empower that honesty? Honestly, it's empathy as well. Like just because an issue doesn't face you because of your, your demographic doesn't mean that it's not an issue. It doesn't face a lot of people and being in tune with that is really important. Does this look good? Does this look really bad? I don't know. Something I found quite shocking, interesting was that something like 40% of Fortune 500 businesses were founded by immigrants. And immigrants, I think, was twice as likely to be entrepreneurs than non-immigrants. 
And this is because if you're coming to a new country with a wealth of cultural perspectives and opinions, you're more likely to view the systems as not fixed and something that you can change or propose a solution or an alternative to. I don't know if this is better. Ooh. Look at me, I put a face on. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. There was also a whole section on information bubbles versus echo chambers and how they can be really dangerous. Oh. <laughs> That's really bad. Jade. Oh no. Oh wow. Wow, I never do makeup. Okay, this is very obvious. Yeah, so just to touch briefly on echo chambers. Something I didn't know before, the difference between an information bubble and an echo chamber is that an information bubble is where you're just isolated from other ideas. It's for example, you're on a random island in the middle of nowhere and you are literally fed one narrative, but you don't know others exist. An echo chamber is different because an echo chamber is where they teach you that the perspective that's opposite to yours is wrong. You see this in anti-black narratives. It's not that they don't know the perspective that like, I don't know, oh, equality and inclusion. It's that they're taught that that is wrong, which is very problematic because there was this whole study done in the book where they exposed people to the opposite opinions to the one that they helm, like extreme opinions. It actually just made them even more righteous. It's like, how do you convince someone whose perspective is so set to see the alternative when they are literally being taught that the alternative is something they should never consider? And there's this really interesting example of someone who was like really radically racist and how someone managed to build their trust. And it was only when this trust was built that they could actually start to propose different narratives, different perspectives to them. This person was one of the biggest white supremacists in the US and they actually denounced white supremacy and did a whole like apology thing online. So it is possible, but very difficult. And something I really took from the book in this section was the idea that I think the fact that we vilify and hate and demonize people who have different political expressions to us is part of the reason why the extreme radicalists are never gonna change their opinion because in us demonizing them, it just proves their point. Like, oh, the liberals are trying to change us, da 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 da, -da. Like, you just can't fight that radicalism with more hate. And this is also why cancel culture can be really dangerous. It's like, oh, they're Tory, like, no longer associating with them. Like, surely if you really didn't agree with someone's beliefs, the best thing you could do is to engage with them and try and understand them to the point where you can then refute them in a way that that person's going to understand and and make them not defensive like i don't know i obviously get it if someone's racist like get out like i don't want to associate myself with you but i did i thought it was just a really interesting argument for being more open-minded to other people does that make any sense i don't know read the book read the book i can't everything i'm saying is both paraphrasing and what I've learnt. So it's like an extension of what the, the material is actually saying. Should I do some mascara? Oh, go on then. Okay. But yeah, if there's anything I learnt from this book, it's just that naturally we want to silo ourselves into the same mindset, the people with the same background, the things that are going to confirm and validate our worldviews. And that is the most <laughs> problematic way of trying to solve problems in the world. Our governments need to be more diverse and actively inclusive. The largest companies in the world need to be more diverse and actively inclusive. Institutions and the people at the top of institutions need to be more diverse and actively inclusive. Interesting exercise for you. What does your social media feed look like? Who are you following? Do they represent a really similar background to you? Or do you constantly try and expose yourself to people of different cultures, races, religions, potentially in political ideologies? Like it can be interesting to read and engage with people who disagree with you. That's how you gain a deeper understanding. Again, I don't know if what I'm saying makes any sense to you, but this book also made me so grateful that I go to the institution that I go to because I grew up 
in a not very diverse area. In my last video, I used the word chav, okay? And I have always heard this used comically and I never looked into the background of it. I never really thought that much of it, but I didn't even realize that that's quite a classist word. If you look, if you like trace back its history. I feel like it was necessary for me to add something on this because I genuinely feel ashamed that firstly that I didn't know the background behind that word. Secondly, that I said it and used that word. Thirdly, that I put it on the internet. So if you use that word too, please just like look into the history of it. I just want to say I'm also really grateful for the fact that I get to learn and unlearn so rapidly on the internet. So please just keep educating me on things like this. I'm almost grateful that I said it because now that is a word that is no longer in my vocabulary. Okay, thanks. I also grew up in a very white area, a mainly conservative area. These aren't excuses for getting things wrong and for holding certain beliefs. But when you are siloed in your mindset and your exposure to other people, it's just really hard to appreciate other perspectives. I'm just so grateful that the university I go to now forces me to engage with so many opinions and perspectives that like, I'm the only British person, like that's it, you know? Like I didn't ever really consider the effect of colonization that much because our British history doesn't really teach it. And then I became really close friends with Pakistani people, Kenyan people, Indian people, and it's literally affected their cultures, their lives, their families, the language they speak, all of that to the point where I was like, Jane, you need to know more about this and this is a perspective you need to consider. I am very passionate about diversity. I still have a lot to learn, but I hope this video somewhat resonated with you. Read the book, I thought it was great. I wanna read his other book, Black Box Thinking. Apparently it's also great. Also, I should put some lipstick on. I don't, is this color gonna look good? I don't know. Oh, I'm not really a fan. I just look like a, like a Powerpuff girl, I don't know. If I add this on top, will it look better? Better, worse, I don't know. Um, it's also considered kind of cocky as a girl to like hype yourself up and take selfies and post selfies, or whatever. So today we're not bringing that. We're, we're drenching ourselves in self love. So Jay, you look like a queen. Oh. The princess energy is just here. I'm gonna go get my jeans. But thank you so much for watching. Read the book and. Tell me if you like this chatty format, because I actually really enjoyed this. And it's not overly planned or scripted, it's just talking. Oh! Mm, 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 mm. Damn, I love it. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Bye.